As mentioned, I'm Preston Harris, Executive Director of the Scott River Water Trust, and we are talking about the 2014 drought. So we are the exact opposite of Fall River. We have no water. That's, what we're doing. That's pretty much all there is to it. We, um, we'll get into it more, but we had a very difficult time both environmentally and um, in terms of agriculture. Um, dealing with the drought this year. It hit us really hard, just like it did in a lot of other places. So, anyhow, let's jump into it. Uh, Scott River Water Trust, we consider ourselves a win-win for fish and ag. Uh, what we do is reimburse active water users for leaving water in stream for the benefit of salmon and steelhead during critical life stages in priority reaches of the Scott River and tributaries while protecting family farms and offering restoration options to water users. Who is the Water Trust? Myself, Peter Thaler, is the uh, um, contracted flow and fisheries person. We have a five member board, a seven member advisory committee. Our board consists of um, various uh, resource professionals and um, some farming uh, personnel as well. Our advisory committee, local ranchers, Cisco RCD, the Watershed Council, UC Cooperative Extension, uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife, and North Fisheries. Current funding sources Bella Vista, Dean Witter, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, Pacific Corps, um, BOR, Fish and Wildlife Service, and TNC. So, how do we get water in stream? What we end up doing is we acquire our water transactions through uh, short-term forbearance agreements. And these forbearance agreements specify the water right, uh, lease amount, the beginning and end date of the lease, the location, and the approximate in-stream benefit of that specific um, water transaction. So it could be anywhere from uh, 47 miles to 5,000 feet, just depending on how, how big it is. Um, and then we pay a price per acre foot plus bonus payments. Um, that also includes the total estimated volume and the estimated cost of the um, transaction. The estimated volume, uh, that's the total CFS of the transaction actually, um, or the agreement holds. Um, okay, so a little breakdown about the Scott River. Uh, we are a snow felt, um, snow, snow melt fed system. Um, you can see our elevation is almost 9,000 feet to 1,600 feet, 58 um, river miles. It's an alluvial valley that's approximately 33,000 acres. It's a groundwater basin, big rain shadow effect, and it's semi arid, so we're in the range of 21 to 24. Um, inches of rain on average. This year I think we were at 11. The fish that we have in Scott Valley, everybody knows about the fabled coho salmon. Um, the Scott River is the prime tributary, the prime coho producing tributary in the Klamath Basin. Um, we also produce a lot of steelhead trout and Chinook salmon. I am electric. <laughs> um, okay, Scott River uh, Watershed Restoration Checklist. So, anywhere where we have uh, coho salmon or Chinook salmon where they can rear or spawn, there's 100% um, of those locations are fish screen. Uh, we have approximately 80% of livestock fencing throughout the valley. Um, we have 60% stock water systems in place so hopefully landowners don't have to rely on the on the river system as often um, to water their livestock so those those systems are in place we we consider water conservation a big plus the scott river is 100 percent decreed through three different uh, decrees um, we have a water master service that covers approximately 10 to 12 percent of the uh, the watershed, water leasing is a big plus. We've done seven 1707 in-stream right dedications. Um, 
So that we're, we're really trying to ramp that up and do more and more of that. And then we have a, a big beaver population, so we're really you know, positive about that. As well. um, in Scott Valley, farming and ranching is the uh, primary economy. And figuring out a way to balance the water needs is obviously what we do. Uh, irrigation, both surface and groundwater, is for alfalfa, pasture, grain crops, and um, occasional uh, specialty crops. That covers approximately 32,000 acres from April to September. And then livestock watering is year round. Okay. So, the summer habitat priorities for the Scott River Water Trust include juvenile coho salmon and adults and juvenile steelhead trout. So we do this in the tributaries of French Creek, Patterson Creek, um, Shackleford and Sugar, and those associated tributaries. Generally, we start in early um, July and our transactions go through October 1st, but um, this year we actually started much earlier than that, given the, the severe drought. Um, it's all that depends on the water type. And our range in the summertime is anywhere from 0.2 CFS, so that's our bottom baseline. We don't, we don't lease below 0.2 CFS. And it's not that we max out at 5 um, CFS, it's just we've never done anything above that. The range that we have. Um, so 2007 through 2013, um, our water lease volumes. You can see that uh, the water the water trust started as a water leasing program in 2007, and actually became a water trust in 2010. So you see a pretty consistent um, transaction in terms of acre feet that we did. So you know we're in the, the low to mid 300 acre feet. 2011 being an extremely wet year, there wasn't a, much of a need. Um, 2012, I took over in 2013 as the executive director. That was obviously a critically dry year. And um, we were able to put 477 acre feet in stream for juvenile coho salmon and, and steelhead trout. So that was, a, that was something that was really big. Coho returns in the Scott, we have, I think everybody here has a pretty good idea of what the Scott is and what it does. Uh, we have three, our, our coho are a three year cycle, um, one large brood year, two smaller brood years. Um, the smaller brood years are growing, um, which is really encouraging. And you can see that uh, 2011 and 2012, you know, drastic improvements from 2008 and 2009. Um, unfortunately, we have an incomplete data set in 2002 uh, because we had a big flood come through and we had to pull this out over a month and a half early. So the, the, that run really only got a couple of weeks. So we don't know what, what 2012 offered. So um, it remains an enigma. Okay, so trying to move pretty quickly here because we got a lot of information um, to cover. And so, drought issues on the Scott. Obviously, again, 2014, really difficult year. Um, what we faced was 2,731 observed coho adults. That is, hands down, the largest amount of coho salmon in the state of California. And the region, so the Southern Oregon, Northern California coho region from uh, what is it, the Rogue River, and somebody help me out. Where is it in that? Somewhere near San Francisco. But Jen? You know what it is? I can, I, 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 I can never remember where it is. But anyway, so we had, for the best of our knowledge, we had approximately anywhere from uh, 54 to 75% of the total coho in the state of California in the region. Um, Obviously, the, the drought was 2 to 8% snowpack, where it being a snowpack-driven system, that's obviously very problematic. Um, coho being a valley, uh, or excuse me, coho being a tributary spawner, there's only one tributary open to coho spawning adults. And 
that tributary was actually running in really low flow, so we couldn't even really, or Cuba couldn't even really get up there. So that forced all the coho salmon to span to, to spawn in an approximate 10 mile reach um, of the main stem Scott River, and directly on top of uh, Chinook spawning grounds. So the Chinook came in, and they spawned within this 10 mile reach, which they always do on an annual basis. Uh, Coho came in and were forced to spawn right on top of it. So we were also really concerned about what that was going to do to the, the Chinook run. Turned out it didn't really impact it all that well, but anyways. Um, so what we were going to be dealing with was the potential emergence of 4 million Coho fry. Now that's at the very highest. We know that we didn't get 4 million fry, but that's, you know, the, uh, the high mark. Um, that would lead to overpopulation, uh, high potential for disease, high potential for predation, and a very high liability for the water users. It's also an enormous risk to the ESU. Um, if we do, we all kind of realize that if we didn't do anything, the entire ESU would be at risk. And that is something that was just unacceptable. So that's really why we kind of got this whole party up and going. And then during this crisis, we needed to find a balance between farming and fish as well. Um, this is the hydrograph over from 2013 to uh, September 2014. The orange yellow line is the 70 plus year historical trend. Uh, the blue line is 2013-2014. So we were obviously far below that. And you can see that we did have a little period there in March where we had some really good rains, but it was so warm we didn't get any snow. And so that might have saved us a little bit, but we were pretty much around the um, 4 to 6 CFS range at the gauge outside of Fort Jones, which is just... I mean, we were, we were setting records daily for low flow over the 70-year uh, the period. Okay, so clearly we had a major crisis on our hands. Uh, we had to do something. Here's what we did. In 2013, the Water Trust, Cisco RCD, um, landowners, irrigation districts, slash companies began discussing the issues. So we knew that we had a problem on our hands. We didn't know how big this problem was going to be. Um, it was mid-December and we knew that we were going to be in a drought. We knew that all the coho were spawning in this identified 10 mile reach. What are we going to do to address that? Uh, January 2014, the Water Trust, Cisco RCD, uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife formed a working group to understand the issues, uh, developed develop an overall approach and meet and update regularly. So we started meeting in January once a week to just give ourselves weekly updates. So, so many fish here, so many there, still no improved flow, and then just discuss really what our approach to this rescue effort was going to be over a, uh, you know, a week to week basis. Uh, February and March 2014, the Forest Service, NOAA, Toss Soto of the Group Tribe, Sari Sommerstrom, a Scott River consultant, were added to our working group. Um, the Forest Service turned out to be really big. The others did too. Uh, March and April 2014, the approach was finalized and it led to state and federal landowner assurances, um, landowner buy-in, fish monitoring within the 10 mile reach and, the, and associated tributaries, securement of emergency funds for the Water Trust, uh, we actually were able to influence um, the uh, California drought declaration that the governor, governor signed. So we had a lot of wording that we were able to get into that. Mm -hmm. And then um, this all led to spring water transactions, which in the Scott River, I mean, in the springtime, you should be dealing with extreme high flows, not water transactions. So uh, May through October 2014, Fish relocation started in coordination with the water transaction, our monitoring increased, and a wealth of information was gained. So our highest priorities were obtaining landowner assurances. Without these landowner assurances, which were federal and state protection, we were not going to be able to do all these big things that we were talking about doing. Um, and really the, the beauty behind all this is that to get these assurances, we got them 
in, over the course of three months. And these are the types of things that take three years to put together. So it was a really a, a tip of the brim to the agencies to understand that we can't, we don't have time to BS, we gotta get these things figured out. Um, and the landowners, everybody was really flexible and we all came to a, to a conclusion um, with a really limited negotiation, so that was really good. Um, we had to obtain landowner access. Again, we had all these great ideas, we were gonna do all this stuff, but we had to pitch this to landowners, both where we were taking the fish from and where we were gonna put them because coho salmon love private property. So we had to, uh, we had to, to convince the relocation landowners that this was a, a good idea as well. Um, the Water Trust needed to secure funds. Um, we were about a hundred plus thousand dollars short um, in terms of what we needed to pull this off, so I hit the ground running and I was able to come up with several thousands of dollars in terms of uh, um, transaction funds. We just called it emergency funds and that goes, that was in part to NOAA Fisheries, um, NIFWF, and the Nature Conservancy. So they were all, those were our, our emergency funding sources. And then the RCD needed to dig up, because um, we're also RCD employees, we had to dig up uh, monitoring funds and the Forest Service paid us um, or provided us with that. Um, we had to address a lot of legal complications. Um, when you're dealing with, with this many water transactions and so many different water users um, within uh, these ditches, you have a lot of legal complications that you had to address, so that was a lot of fun. So we were able to get through that. And then agreeing on the overall approach. Um, that was something that, you know, you're dealing with multiple organizations, multiple um, landowners, uh, agencies, a lot of different personalities. We all came to, a, to an agreement on the overall approach and that actually went really smooth. So, everything that we did, everything that we put together, um, a lot of work, a lot of time, it all led to a mess of headache. <laughs> <laughs> That's me totally burnt out on this thing, and uh, that was um, actually I was sick the other day, and uh, that's my first ever selfie. So, uh, but it was it was a complete pain in the neck. Anyways, one massive headache and the largest fish rescue and relocation effort in the history of the Klamath Basin and in the history of the state of California. Right. And uh, we did that. Too. Um, Thanks. We didn't. We didn't know uh, that was going to be the case. Chuck Bonham actually informed me of that the other day. Um, so that was really um, kind of an eye opener there. So, anyways, getting into the water transactions, Farmers Ditch water transaction was our spring um, transaction. This was a really complicated water transaction. It was. Um, oh geez, it took a. <laughs> A lot of time, a lot of our legal funds. Um, we had, oh man, probably five to six landowners that signed on and three that didn't, so we had to, to balance all that. Um, it's the largest agreement that the Water Trust has ever done. Um, we leased approximately two thirds of the water rights, so almost 20 CFS. Non participants, uh, we had to guarantee their full water rights and their respective surplus flows. Um, the participants did receive monetary compensation, um, however, it was nowhere near what it should have been. We were not able to pay them what they needed. So they had the, the farmers that, that were giving up their water literally gave it up for a, a tenth of the price of what it should have been. Um, we were able to document the lease flow, which is what Peter's going to talk about here shortly. Um, so that was really important. Um, the Farmer's Ditch runs through the legacy issue of the tailings reach in Scott Valley, or through the Scott River, and so there's always a lot of information that's, or a lot of information that needs to be obtained so we can get a good idea of how to properly manage that reach of the Scott. So uh, anyways, this, this gave us the opportunity to, to get some information there. It also gave us the opportunity to do some fish monitoring from the head gate down through the tailings, um, because the tailings reach is largely sterile habitat. There's not a lot of um, cover. It's, it's large, um, cobbled. The, the river was mined um, 
40, 50 years ago was literally turned on its side. So it's, it's about six miles of sterile habitat that we are going to be able to get some really good information on. So, Peter, go ahead. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, my role in the Water Trust. I do uh, a lot of the flow monitoring. So once Preston has uh, identified uh, a lease priority and negotiated the lease, I show up uh, oftentimes with the water master and verify that the full legal quantity of the water right is in the ditch. Both the water master and I, water master and I verify that and measure that and then reduce the ditch accordingly. Sometimes we'll shut off the ditch 100%. Um, which is always the easiest thing to do, uh, or in the case of the farmer's ditch, uh, like Preston was saying, uh, two-thirds of the water users wanted to do a lease, the other third didn't, and so I had to, on a weekly basis, go measure the stream, measure the ditch, and make sure that the, the uh, lease agreement was being met. And so uh, one of the monitoring locations, like Preston was just talking about in the tailings, was uh, a mile and a half below the uh, point of diversion at Farmer's Ditch, and that was at the point in the tailings that we thought would go dry first. And so we thought this would be an opportunity not only to lease water, improve stream flow, and uh, sustain connecti connectivity longer for the coho juveniles downstream that were merging, and provide access for them to get up to Sugar Creek, the South Fork, and East Fork of the Scott River, which are have uh, very good uh, rearing habitat. Um, so this was the spot we identified as being uh, the first place to dry and uh, you can see I put in some details about the, where the lease started and, and as Preston showed in the previous slide, uh, the ditch was reduced by about 20 CFS so you can see almost a 20 CFS increase in flow and all those wavy lines is just the diurnal fluctuation of the stream. I mean in our snow melt system, snow is melting and you know, the stream flow comes up. At nighttime, the melt slows, and so unlike a, a spring-fed system that's probably pretty steady flow, we have a big uh, diurnal or daily fluctuation. And then a couple of those big spikes uh, here and here were rain events, and then we finally saw the tailings go dry here, and uh, so that's where we lost connectivity, uh, the first point of connectivity lost in the Scott River of that season. and. Uh, it's hard to say exactly what would have happened without this lease, but I mean, if you just look at the line, the trend would likely be, you know, the tailings going dry probably a month earlier. So, you know, the assumption is we maintain connectivity and passage for juveniles for a month. And uh, CDFW was doing a lot of the fish handling and uh, pit tagging during the rescue effort. And so uh, we actually had some fish that were tagged, tracked, in Sugar Creek, so we knew that this lease actually allowed fish to get from the lower part of the Scott River up to critical uh, rearing areas. Uh, here's just a little chart and summary of some of the other lease locations. The blue line is stream flow before the lease, and the red line is stream flow after the lease. And uh, uh, FR just stands for French Creek, so you can see uh, a lot of our leases were focused on French Creek. It was the one tributary, like Preston was saying, that had uh, connectivity during spawning season, so we knew there were adults there, we know there were juveniles there already, and it was the tributary that was connected to the Scott River for the longest amount of time, so it was the one place that the juveniles could get to naturally. And so that was uh, a big place where we focused a lot of our efforts in leasing. and. Uh, I mean, you can see, like Preston was saying, we're only dealing with small quantities of water. You know, sometimes it's only uh, 0.2 CFS, sometimes it's 1 CFS. But um, in some really small parts, I mean, we're more than doubling stream flow. And this was one spot along the main stem where it, we actually went from uh, a couple hundred feet of dry channel to uh, almost 2 CFS and connected a couple isolated pools, gave fish more of an opportunity to migrate upstream, and just maintained uh, cold water for the fish that were holding in pools downstream. So that, that transaction he just talked about went from zero CFS to two CFS. We, we were able to supply two CFS, which doesn't sound like a lot, but on the Scott, it, it really is. To, we were able to give that water to probably 50,000 juvenile salmon. 
So that was like a really big, these transactions, they look small, but the amount of fish that they're impacting is, is incredible. And let me see, and so this is just a picture to give you an idea of what the tailings look like. Um, here's the flow station I had set up that had that water level logger that uh, I used to create that hydrograph, that first blue squiggly line you all saw. Um, so it was on the second, the first day that the tailings were observed dry, and it could have dried the day before. Uh, it's hard to say exactly. I can't be out there every minute of every day. Um, but uh, that's just, like Preston was saying, one of the big legacy issues that we have in the Scott River and one of the first places to disconnect in our system. Um, and then here's just another picture of uh, one of our other lease locations, just so you can see what some really prime coho habitat looks like. Uh, just really good shade cover, a lot of complexity, and uh, riparian canopy down below. And then this is the water master, uh, Michelle. She's just uh, reducing a head gate there as we were uh, just modifying uh, a, one of our transactions and just decreasing the ditch flow by half. So that's just kind of what, it, what some of our action looks like. Um, and that's, that's my summary. It's a summary. So, let's get one of your slides up. So the, um, the summer transactions, we did uh, eight on Fridge Creek, two on Sugar Creek, two on the main stem Scott. They range from 0.2 to 2 CFS. And if you remember the first slide, where last year we set the record for 477 CFS. This year, this does not include the farmer's ditch lease. So. This was this year, this summer, we were able to put in 800 plus acre feet. Um, and over the course of 15 plus miles. Um, we had a lot of people committed, but they just flat ran out of water, which was really unfortunate because we, I mean, with this, we probably would have been somewhere around 2,000 acre feet had the water been there. The landowners were very willing and they were very much ready to go, but this was a type of drought that no one had experienced, and so. <coughs> Made things very difficult. Oh, there's that. So, um, why didn't we do it when he did? You're <laughs> electric. <laughs> okay, so the the in totals that we ended up um, uh, the amount of fish they ended up moving seventeen or one one hundred seventeen thousand plus, and then approximately a little bit over sixteen thousand steelhead. So that's really quite a bit of fish. Those fish were removed from the main stem um, in, in conjunction with all of our water transactions. So the water transactions were going in, into the main stem to remove fish and put them, uh, pretty much keep them alive and then remove them into um, various tributaries throughout the, uh, um, the water. So Peter's going to really talk about the rescue side. I didn't have any, any of the science stuff so he can talk about the rescuing and the pit tag as well. So here's uh, some uh, technicians with California Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, and then uh, two other field technicians at the RCD and myself all also assisted with uh, some of the relocation effort, though most of the RCD's involvement was going out and diving all the reaches and telling CDFW, hey, here's where the biggest populations of fish are, here's the areas that are starting to dry and become fragmented, and we would help them develop uh, priorities of where to rescue. And so we would send them maps on a, a weekly or bi-weekly basis, and then they would go out and respond. And so here's them netting groups of fish, kind of filtering through, and then there's a bunch of other sequences in here that we don't have pictures of, um, but it's probably really similar to the pit tagging effort that you guys did, only we're dealing with little juvenile fish, um, where we would hold them, count them, sort them by species, uh, tag as many fish as we could before the daily temperatures got too warm and it became too much of a stress on the fish. And so it was hard to say, um, I mean, Chris Adams was the lead uh, fish rescue and tag monitor, well, I'd say he was the main tagging and monitoring person, so he ha understands all that data much better than I do, but uh, I'd say somewhere between 5 and 10% of all the coho were tagged, and uh, 
Oftentimes at a main stem Scott River site like this, they would tag somewhere between 60 and 200 fish and leave them in the Scott River to see where they would naturally go to, on their own if they would go downstream or upstream or maybe even to a nearby tributary. And, there, um, and then the, uh, the majority of the fish would all be re relocated to an upper tributary and then another 50 or 100 or however many could be tagged would be tagged and placed there also. So um, the one, some interesting results Chris shared with me with the pit tagging is that uh, one fish that was tagged and then left in the main stem Scott River uh, was detected seven miles <coughs> upstream the next day in a French Creek tributary. So we, we definitely verified fish movement through the system. Um, so there's definitely a lot more analysis that's going to look at that data and really digest what it means. Um, I'm just sharing some of the interesting details I remember. Um, and then another interesting thing Chris shared with me was one of the fish that was tagged and taken really high up in French Creek at the Duck Lake tributary was detected the next day leaving the mouth of French Creek. So we know that some of the fish that we brought to what we thought were much better locations preferred to be elsewhere. So uh, there was a lot of effort put into monitoring this rescue effort because the hope is to evaluate how effective is this, what are the survival rates, and you know that'll be something that takes three to four years to fully understand as a lot of those tagged fish come back to the system and those tagged fish leave our system. So that's something that RCD is uh, starting to assist CDFW with more is some increasing of the pit tagging and monitoring stations within the Scott River and the uh, watershed uh, council is also starting to do some of that monitoring with their projects also. So my thought is that's a really effective technology and it's really teaching us a lot about how fish use our system. Um, so here's just some more pictures of a little baby coho that was probably just tagged right at the mouth of French Creek. And uh, here is what one of the uh, array detection sites or systems looks like. Um, it's just PVC tubing with a coaxial cable running through it that's plugged into some crazy little data logger that picks up the signal and stores it. And then uh, CDFW technicians come out uh, on a once a week or every other week and download the data and uh, store it and make sure everything's operating correctly. So uh, this was just upstream of the mouth of French Creek. If you could walk down river, French Creek would be right here. And so this was just one detection uh, station to for fish that were tagged and left lower in the system to see if they came up into French Creek or if they went up into the tailings uh, area. Um, so this is, you want to cover, this is just kind of general. Conclusion. Yeah, this is our, um, we don't have any of this information, it hasn't, it hasn't been compiled yet. Uh, there's a lot of data that we need to get and bring together. Um, but the preliminary information says that we had good survival in the relocation sites, water quality and habitat at those rel relocation sites uh, sustained throughout the year, so that was very, um, that was a good thing. We monitored that very closely. Fish survival within the main stem was good. So we actually, we didn't move fish unless we absolutely had to. That was one of the baseline um, points of conversation we just, that we all came to, to an agreement on. If we have to move fish, we will. If we don't, they're gonna stay. We had good water quality, we had good DO. Uh, we did not have overpopulation. So we ended up, you know, we didn't try and remove all the fish. We, are, we estimate that there was probably 60,000 juveniles that actually stayed in the main stem. Um, however, that main stem predation was very heavy. We knew that was going to happen. The, all the mergansers and all the other critters that eat fish were fat, dumb, and happy. Um, and then we had, it was just excellent partnership building. The whole process was just very good. Um, we had a huge fallout from the uh, 2010 ITP with the Department of Fish and Game, now the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, we got strong partnership building with the Forest Service, with NOAA. Um, so that was very beneficial. We'll quickly sh uh, shoot through our flow needs for the fall. Um, we do fall transactions for Coho and, and Chinook on the Scott River um, in early October uh, through November for Chinook and November through 
oftentimes through January for coho. Um, how much we assume that 25 CFS at uh, the USGS gauge is going to get our Chinook spawners into the valley. Right now we are sitting at 9. Um, and 50 CFS actually gets them through the tailings reach. So the water trust, we try to get fall transactions, which are stock water rights, put in stream to push that water down. Um, our flow volumes in the fall are much larger because we're dealing with larger amounts of water because it's not during the growing season. We're able to acquire 7, 12 CFS at a time. So our acre feet that we're releasing is actually much higher. So you can see that you know 800 acre feet last year, almost 1,200 acre feet the year before, is um, it's very effective. We we're getting connectivity. That's that's from River Mile 47 all the way to the mouth. So you know we were putting in 12 CFS in a snow melt um, driven system. That's uh, that's a lot of important water. Uh, current conditions on the Scott, it is right now disconnected. Hopefully it will not be disconnected after tonight. We're supposed to get some rain. We've got about 10 miles of disconnected river. Um, after, just to give you guys an idea about how dry it's been, we've had approximately two and a half to three inches of rain in October, and we are not really anywhere close to being connected. So usually an inch of rain in the fall when we're not connected will get us connected. So. Uh, you know, we still have 10 miles to go. So that's how severe the drought was on the Scott River. Uh, according to CDFW, there's approximately 3,000 to 5,000 Chinook holding in the canyon reaches waiting to come up. Uh, we had the state um, put the hammer down on us this year and handed out curtailment notices. So we are actually not able to do any fall transactions because uh, irrigators are not able to um, divert for stock water. And then flat out, we just need more rain. Uh, other challenges that we have in the watershed not related to drought, they're going to be consistent with anybody else's. Um, we have a lack of general funding for our RCB positions, um, limited staff, myself and Peter and then another gal named Lindsay Magrinay do the majority of the work in the Scott River. Um, an incredible amount of emphasis is put on the Scott River and its fish production and yet we have a hard time keeping three people employed. So that's actually very much a problem for us um, and we're hitting the ground running as, as often as we can but a lot of the stuff we do we do not get paid for we, we do a lot of volunteer time um, we'd like to divert away from that but that's just kind of the game. that doesn't give us flexibility so the, the three of us are really we're, we're hamstrung in a lot of ways in terms of being able what we can do and, and how much manpower we have and then we're getting some board member burnout, especially I think at our RCD level. A lot of those guys have been on that board for a long time. We deal with extremely complicated issues, very highly publicized issues on Scott. Um, according to our antagonists, we're the worst um, people around. Uh, spend a day with us and you're going to find that that's the exact opposite. But um, so board member burnout is definitely there and it's a real thing. Uh, anyway, special thanks to the CDFW crews, Cisco RCD, No Fisheries, uh, the Forest Service, our consultants, the Water Master Service, Peter at the Water Trust, and of course the Scott Valley landowners because without them we would have never been able to pull this thing off. And you know this presentation is really, it, it, it would take an hour and a half for anybody to get a really good understanding of what we did. We're really we're trying to fly through it right now and give you guys an idea of really the complications and, and all the issues we face. So if you ever want to learn more about it or you just want to talk about things on the Scott, you can always feel free to contact me for the information. That's all we got.